Well, I have the last, the difficult task of being the last speaker of the day in this very hot uh, room, but I hope you are still with me. So uh, my talk is about using high throughput phenotyping to improve accuracy in, gen in genomic prediction. So as already have been, has been said, normally uh, breeders want to use uh, genomic prediction, and normally this is done in a single trait way. And the basic idea is that they split the whole data set into a training set uh, that has been observed in the field. So you have phenotypic data and marker data. And you have another uh, set of genotypes that we call the validation set that only has marker data. So we use the phenotypic information and genotypic information collected for the training set to train a statistical model and predict those that have never been observed. Now, this can be expanded into a more complex model in a multi-trait situation in which, for example, uh, uh, biomass and yield are modeled simultaneously. And this is expected to have a higher prediction accuracy when the heritability of these component traits like biomass are larger than the heritability of the target trait grain yield. But also, there needs to be a genetic correlation between both traits. Another type of prediction scenario that can be interesting for breeders is, is it possible to use biomass measured early in the growing season to predict yield at the end of the growing season? Again, this is possible, but we need a large correlation between the indicator trait biomass early and the target trait yield at the end. However, as you see in the bottom of the, and the slide here, the ranking of genotypes for biomass changes over time. So we have some GBI over time, and this reduces the correlation between biomass and yield. We have also another problem. If we want to approximate biomass for many genotypes, this is really expensive and difficult, and we need to phenotype many time points. So one way of approximating these correlated traits is by high throughput phenotyping. However, the heritability of high throughput phenotyping also changes over time. So this is yet another challenge that needs to be considered. So during this talk, I will uh, refer myself to two objectives. First, to improve yield prediction, integrating information of component traits over the whole growing season. And the second is to produce yield predictions from component traits measured early in the growing season. To do so, we combined some statistical models with crop growth models to simulate data that could come from a phenotyping platform. And the basic idea is that we have some genetic model, so some QTL or genomic prediction model, underlying some absent parameters. So each of the 970 weed genotypes uh, had a different value for each of these parameters. And this different value was explained by the SNPs. So we introduced these absent parameters uh, and some environmental information to produce biomass over time and yield and yield components also at, at the end of the growing season. However, if we introduce a certain parameter value to absent with a certain environmental covariables, we always get the same value because absent is fully deterministic, so it doesn't have error. We assume that this true value, if we make the analogy with a breeding context, would be the true genetic value that is hidden inside the genotype. But usually, we do not observe it. We only can approximate a value through an experiment so here we always have some kind of experimental error. And we, if we add the absent value to some plot error, we would have some biomass phenotypic value. So the biomass that we can directly measure in the field. But we cannot usually, usually, we, usually we cannot measure biomass directly in the field. We use high throughput phenotyping. So we have yet another source of error. And this source of error is dynamic. So at the very beginning, it's usually very difficult to measure biomass precisely. Then this precision increases, but as soon as the canopy closes, this precision drops again. So we use this dynamics in the error 
to attach it to each uh, simulated uh, biomass. And we use two levels of error. So a um, high error, so 1.5, what has been reported from experimental data, and a low error, so uh, more precise measurements. Then we wanted to uh, integrate these uh, high throughput measurements over time. And to do so, we used mixed model P splines. Here it was uh, collabor collaborating with uh, Martin Burr. And the splines are a very, very flexible way of modeling these uh, biomass dynamics over time. They are also very fast, and for that reason, they are suitable to handle large data sets like those coming from high throughput phenotyping platforms. So we wanted to evaluate what happens, whether we measure biomass, let's say, at uh, 20 every 20 days, and with that, we feed a spline, or if we can afford a more uh, frequent measurement, so every five days. And in both cases, we fitted the spline, and we uh, uh, obtained the, the spline fitted values for each day during the growing season. We wanted to integrate these biomass measurements in a genomic prediction model. So the benchmark is the single trait. So we only have yield information to train our model. And then we have a second scenario in which we combine biomass and yield to uh, improve, hopefully, the prediction of, of yield. So we split the 970 genotypes into a training set of 250. And we predicted the remaining 720. We run the model and the simulation is in two situations. The first situation is in era 2009. It's an uh, environment in which we have more or less constant temperature during the growing season, and the stress levels for the water stress level were not uh, too uh, large. As you see in the, in the black line, they were more or less constant as well. And in this case, we see that the correlation or, uh, or yield is mostly correlated to biomass and to grain number, but not so much to flowering time and grain weight. In a second environment that we did have a thermal stress during grain filling, filling, we see that the correlation between yield and biomass drops, and the yield differences are mainly explained by differences in grain weight. So we have two scenarios in which a different trait is responsible for inducing differences in, in, in yield. At the bottom of the slide, we see the dynamics of biomass for different time points. So the observed biomass would be these single dots that have their own heritability. So you can calculate the heritability for the raw NDVI data, for example. And this heritability is more or less low. So we have every 20 days. And depending on the size of the error, the heritability can range between 0 0.15 up to 0 0.6. So this is not extremely good, let's say. However, when we take the data of the spline fitted values, so here on the line, and we calculate the heritability for this spline bit fitted values, we obtain a far larger value, so a heritability of around 0.8. So in this case, it shows that it's very convenient to combine the information during the growing season to improve the quality of our biomass estimates. The second question is, is it, uh, how, how large is the correlation between our uh, component trait biomass and yield? Because remember, only if this is large, we can have a successful prediction. In the case of uh, ERADU, we see that the correlation between biomass and yield is more or less increases rapidly uh, after sowing, and it remains more or less constant. This is consistent with, with the large correlation that we see at harvest. In the second environment, the NDVI measurements were almost not correlated with yield. So in this case, biomass is not very informative about uh, yield. And the reason for this is because the trait that is underlying yield differences is, is determined at the end of the growing season, is grain weight. 
So initial periods are not really so relevant compared to the final period. Then putting everything together, we had our single trait model that is kind of the reference. And we had a multi-trait uh, model in which we combined yield and biomass. And in the case of uh, ERA 2009, in which the correlation between yield and biomass was large, the, the prediction accuracy is largely improved. However, of course, no improvement no, we do not gain by uh, including biomass if the correlation is very low. For the second question about whether we can predict yield at the end of the growing season from biomass measured early in the growing season, the results are consistent with the previous slide. So for the environment in which biomass is correlated to yield, we can even uh, start at the days 40 after sowing to generate yield predictions. And these predictions are even better than, it sounds a bit con contradictory, that because uh, predicting yield from biomass is better than predicting yield from yield. And you say, why is this? It's because the large differences in heritability. When we combine the information during the growing season and we capture the whole dynamics of biomass generation, this biomass was around 0.8. When we have a single uh, point estimate for yield with a large measurement error, the heritability was 0.5. So in this case, yield was less informative than biomass. And in the case of the other environment, uh, the correlation between yield and biomass was extremely low. So in this case, it was not possible to generate uh, yield predictions from biomass. The main message from this uh, very complicated story is that when we integrate statistical models and crop growth models, that allows us or gives us some tool to assess when it is convenient to phenotype some traits. Here, a lot has been discussed that we need to include more traits to measure more things, but we actually need to know when this will be bring extra information. Otherwise, it's, it's, it's very nice to have large data sets, but we also need to think about uh, how we can integrate this in the breeding process. And we think that this integration between statistics and crop growth models allows very nice um, evaluation of different scenarios. The second is that incorporating trade dynamics over time in a multi-trait uh, genomic prediction model showed larger accuracy compared to single traits in prediction. Of course, this depends on the environment. And um, yield can be su successfully predicted from biomass early in the growing season if heritability of biomass is large. And when it's large, usually when you do the whole integration of time points, uh, this is better than evaluated single time points. And the last one is, um, well, this is related to the second, the previous one, and the time is up, so I will uh, not read it fully. I want to thank uh, Ban Yu Sang for helping me uh, to learn about the uh, APSIM, and also Becas Chile because uh, they funded my PhD project. So I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Daniela. Thank you very much. <laughs> we, I think we have time for three questions. And then we have a general discussion, 15 minutes, yes. Uh, great talk, Daniela. Um, uh, I was confused a little bit because at some points it looks like you use biomass and NDVI kind of uh, as the same thing. Uh, yeah. So when you talk about yeah. uh, heritability of biomass, uh, um, are you talking about NDVI bi uh, biomass or are you talking about actual biomass estimate. Yes, actually I didn't, uh, I should have made this, this distinction more clear. Here I was talking about the approximation of biomass that you get from NDVI. So yeah, basically the NDVI fitted values. So how do you deal, like uh, we know that especially when you have uh, diverse populations where you have a big range of the other traits, like differences in canopy architecture, NDVI doesn't work that great as a prediction of biomass. Yeah, well in this case, yeah, I, I, um, there is very little information reported in literature about the uh, error dynamics. So I based myself on what is available, but of course in an extremely diverse uh, population, 
the error would be larger. <coughs> However, for example, I tried other traits, oh, I, sorry, for, for, for example, uh, like this, uh, for canopy temperature, that the raw heritability on the left for single time points is about 0.1. And if you combine many data points, in this case, for example, measuring daily, you can even increase a lot. So the, the point is, even if the heritability is uh, extremely low, you can always try to measure more often, and that is likely to increase the, the heritability. Yes. Hi, I'm curious what all um, parameters you changed when you were simulating your genotypes using APSIM. Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm asking is because I'm curious whether there's, whether there exists in nature genetic effects of how much the plant uh, sort of assimilates into grain versus into stock, because that would decrease the association between your biomass total and your grain yield. Yes. Uh, well, I based myself, first I looked, there is a sensitivity analysis in a paper uh, by Pierre Casadevac, and then they report which parameters are influencing mostly grain yield. Uh, but also you need some reported genetic variation for them. And uh, regarding you, your specific question about biomass partitioning, I did modify a parameter that is the number of grains per gram of stem. Uh, so then you have some differences in harvest index, but the range in, uh, yeah, the range is very small, let's say, yes. Mm -hmm. So what I did, I checked how uh, similar are the harvest indexes that I obtained with what you observe in papers uh, from real data, and they were more or less uh, consistent, yes. <laughs> Yeah, one stupid question. Uh, did you measure in uh, inbreds or in hybrids? Yeah, I, I, I think I, I went too quickly through this slide. <laughs> yeah, because. <laughs> because <laughs> yeah, here, well, I did different things, and I think actually in the abstract I said reels, maybe. Okay. So originally I had used reels, but then I uh, used a real diversity panel that uh, was published by uh, Macaferri. Yeah. So it's a spring wheat collection worldwide from 970 no, genotypes. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. But the, the values of in in DBA were above uh, zero seven zero or around 0.8, uh, uh, at antisis, more or less? Uh, because my question is that probably the, the values of in Kibay were really saturated. So the precision of the measuring on biomass uh, at a certain point uh, was very low. Yeah, so this is more or less a little, it's connected to this dip that you see in this part. It occurs yeah. around flowering and it's connected to the same uh, phenomenon that you are saying. The only thing here is a little bit uh, tricky because I am attaching it to real, to absim biomass values. So the, the scale is different from, from NDVI. So here I'm measuring in kilos of biomass, whereas in the NDVI you have a different scale. Yeah. But this is a, well, a, a technical uh, issue. Okay, thank you. Okay.